Most people in wealthy countries take water for granted. You turn on the tap and it comes out. Once every month or two, you pay your bill and you never think twice about it. The system that brings water into our homes and takes it away is invisible to us. We are experiencing lots of change in our water supply. Our traditional sources are not only less available to us, but we're demanding more and more of them. As the climate changes, we see longer periods of drought, and as it gets warmer, more water evaporates. Scarcity is one of our huge problems in the 21st century. We've got to look for new water sources. Sources like brackish water, municipal wastewater, industrial wastewater, and figure out ways um, to treat that water to a quality that enables its reuse. When it comes to turning water that's undrinkable into something that we can put into people's taps, it's chemistry that's the key to solving our problems. Today's water economy is really a linear economy. We take water from pristine natural sources, we treat it, we distribute it in our distribution systems, we use it once, and then we tend to flush it down the toilet. My name is Megan Motter. I'm an associate professor at Stanford University. I am also the research director for the National Alliance for Water Innovation. One of the things that we are really interested in exploring is what it would take to transform that linear water economy into a circular water economy. An economy in which we are reusing water over and over and over again. One goal of research in my lab is to make water desalination more efficient, less carbon intensive, um, and easier to adopt for non-traditional water sources. Desalination is the process of taking salt out of seawater. Very, very early on, people realized that if they could boil water, the condensate would be fresh or pure. Thermal desalination is a pretty simple process, but it has very high capital costs and very high energy costs. One of the biggest breakthroughs was the development of reverse osmosis membranes. In reverse osmosis, you are basically pushing water through a filter, and that filter is allowing um, water to pass through, but it retains salts on the feed side of the membrane. Reverse osmosis reduced the energy intensity of seawater desalination by half. Since then, innovations in pressure exchangers, pretreatment, um, and membrane materials have further reduced the energy intensity by another 50%. In California, there are more than 10 desalination plants up and down the coast. But it's only available to people who live in wealthy coastal communities. And so if we're really going to enhance the security of our water supply, we need to turn to a much more diverse set of non-traditional waters. When people hear the word desalination, they immediately think of seawater desalination. But reverse osmosis and other forms of desalination can make all kinds of waters safe to drink. I'm David Sedlock. I'm a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Berkeley. I study chemicals to make drinking water safe. When we first got serious about building sewage treatment plants, we had this idea of recycled water. Taking the water, disinfecting it with chlorine, and applying it to our lawns and golf courses and highway medians and farm fields. When our cities were built, they were built with two kinds of pipes underground. Water supply pipes, which brought fresh water into our homes, and sewage pipes, which took the dirty water away. And when we came up with this third source of water, recycled water, there was no pipe infrastructure to distribute it around our cities. It wasn't possible to use that recycled water in 
any practical way. There's another way to do it, and that is to take that recycled water and treat it a little bit more and get it to the point where it can go back into the drinking water distribution pipes. The first step is reverse osmosis, desalination, to remove the salts and to remove many of the pathogenic microbes. And then a second step, which we refer to as an advanced oxidation process, to remove any of the chemicals or even pathogens that survive the process of reverse osmosis. If you take hydrogen peroxide and you hit it with some ultraviolet light, it splits into two parts and those two parts are called hydroxyl radicals. And those entities are incredibly reactive with just about any organic compound present on Earth. If it finds an organic chemical, it's going to react with it and break it down. The way in which we scale up this process from a laboratory experiment in a beaker to a great big treatment plant is by having the water flow through pipes and shining ultraviolet light at it after we've added some hydrogen peroxide. And then the water undergoes that advanced oxidation process and the water becomes safe to drink. So desalination has increased a lot over the past few decades. We're at millions of gallons of, of potable water produced per day. One of the biggest challenges uh, with widespread desalination is what to do with the brine. Brine is the waste product from desalination. My name is Will Tarpe. I'm an assistant professor of chemical engineering here at Stanford University. I study wastewater and ways to recover valuable things from it. We started thinking about brine because in some ways it's a wastewater of wastewaters. If I take salty water, and I make fresh water from it, I also make a fraction that is saltier. And the question is, what do you do with that? What we built to treat brine is uh, what we call an electrochemical reactor that facilitates a process called electrochemical water salt splitting. It's using electricity to drive a chemical reaction. That's the electrochemical part. And then we're splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. And then we're splitting salt, sodium and chloride, and pairing those together. What we generate from brine is the hydrochloric acid so far and the sodium hydroxide. And I think the really cool part about this is that these chemicals can be used on site at a desalination plant. After reverse osmosis, we often uh, may add an acid or base to help clean the membranes, for example. You can just make that acid or base on site and use it rather than having to continually ship in trucks. We think about the circular economy as the big motivation for our work. If you can understand the chemistry and how things interact with one another at a really small level, you can control things at a really large level. Understanding these mechanisms means you kind of have like a cheat code to the universe in some ways. In high school, I thought that chemistry was really about working in the lab, and it is. Um, we do a lot of work in the lab, but I think chemistry is actually part of enabling transformative solutions for society. For thousands of years, people have struggled with finding a water supply. But now with modern chemistry, with desalination and advanced oxidation processes, we've opened up a way to access sources of water that 50 years ago seemed undrinkable. That to me is a wonderful gift.